Good morning. Thank you very much for uh, coming to the WFNN talk. So I'm an NP in Canada. Um, I am a neuroscience consultant with the province, and I walk around to different organizations um, and uh, educate nurses in the community in different hospitals about neuroassessment and what we need to do. And I think that this talk is actually a very good segue to the phenomenal talk. You learn something all the time when someone sticks something so complicated such as the CNS into a 45 minute or actually half an hour talk. So I was very impressed by that. So I'm going to talk to you today about neuroassessment and really sort of bringing this all together. Um, you know that listening to this talk, it's, it's fantastic. And when we see patients at the bedside, there's some things that we do as nurses um, in understanding how we are going to put that together in assessment. So what are the, really the goals? The goals are really to become, at the end of this lecture, is really to become familiar and comfortable with, cre with completing a, ba a baseline neurological exam. Why do we need to do these? Um, we really need to understand an assessment because it's the most sensitive indicator for neurological change. And when you see patients subtly, you know that I'm doing something, I know that this part of the brain does that, so this is what I should be seeing. You can also recognize symptoms of early neurolo neurological dysfunction. So what we were seeing 20 minutes ago, perhaps not, we're not seeing now. It's early detection really is, it allows us for successful treatment, management, and prognosis. So in terms of even having conversations with your clinicians or your nurse colleagues, or even with the family, understanding where you're seeing and what you're seeing to the patient also helps develop a bit of trust with the family. And it really discourages you, which, which I'll talk about tomorrow in one of my other talks, is running for the elevator whenever something changes. <laughs> Which we, when we see something and, and in pa people that are not in neurology think that neurological assessment and understanding what's going on with the patient becomes so complicated that it can't be, can't be understood. But what we really want to do is be able to not do this when things begin to change for our patient population. So neurological assessment includes a compilation of, of standards that provide a picture of how the overall system is doing. And when we're doing a neurological assessment that you've all been aware of, we're actually testing the various spots that that fantastic speaker just spoke about. So we're, te we're testing the frontal lobe, we're testing the parietal lobe and the, and the motor cortex and the parietal lobe, which is here, and the cerebellum, uh, sorry, the occipital, the cerebellum and the brainstem. And uh, when we talk about various spots, things are often tested and can be tested conjointly. Um, so sometimes when we do things like the pronator drift, we actually can test more than one system at one time. And again, we assess the cortex, the brainstem. And we also look at things which no one likes to do, which is the cranial nerves. And when we're completing the exam, we really need to begin to ask ourselves, what am I testing? And what am I actually, or what should I see? So sometimes when we go in to assess a patient and we're running through what we believe to be a neurological assessment, I'm always asking myself, um, what should I be seeing in this part of the neurological, neurological exam? So when I'm testing the frontal cortex, I should be seeing frontal lobe findings, but I also have to understand what the frontal lobe findings are. And so having a basic understanding of what each system does and what it should look like actually helps you formulate is this what I, is this correct? Because if it's, it's not correct, then I have to say, I have to step back and say, well, where is that located? And how could I test that system a little more effectively? So a neurological exam includes a verbal history, the history of the presenting illness, the mental status, um, levels of consciousness that we see when our patients, and the attention to task, the judgment of the patient, cranial nerve function, which are cranial nerves 1 through 12, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. We do motor functions such as bulk, strength, and tone. Sensory perception, which is appreciation of the sharp and the dull and the vibration and the proprioception. And I'll tell you a little bit of ways that I've, I've come to understand neurology when I'm testing patients and which to remember which tract does what. And then a cerebellar function. We've all seen patients with cerebellar function problems. And I come from a family of neurology, so whenever we go to weddings, we always look at people doing the chicken dance, and we can say, hey, yeah, you know, I think they've got a little left cerebellary problem because they can't do the chicken dance. So you can actually test your own cerebellum when you're at the wedding doing that chicken dance that we used to do, which I think is now passe. 
So reflexes, again, we look at reflexes, and what you're really testing in a reflex is really the reflex arc. You're testing the sensory route where it enters, uh, moves away from the uh, sen moves away from the extremity into the cord and comes right back out. So you're testing the sensory route, the interneuron, and how it's connected, and and the motor route. So we can almost tell when we have a patient who've lost their reflexes what part of the reflex or where the problem in the spinal cord can be located. So through information gathering, what do you need to what do what do we need to put together into this big puzzle for the patients? And what you really need to do is understand is, can I get a general idea of where the problem may be? Is there something that the patient is saying or something that you're seeing that helps you isolate where you should look? So I had a patient a few days ago who I saw in clinic, and, and the patient actually couldn't figure out simple tasks. And sometimes when we have our allied health, our OT or PT, and they say, hey, you know, can you count backwards from seven? Or if you take this paper, put it in your hand and fold it in bed, fold it and put it on the bed, we're actually patients asking patients to do a complex three-step command. So some things that we're testing, we're testing it, and we're testing particular spots. And should my neurological exam, um, should I find what, I, what I'm hearing when I'm assessing the patient? And should I concentrate on one area more than another? And through questioning and observation, so not only what I'm asking and how the patient and family are interacting with me, but what am I observing when I see a patient? Is there any information, other information that, I, that would help me uh, to source out or assess out, am I seeing something that's normal or should I investigate a little bit further? So let's begin. So let's, I'm gonna walk, we, walk us through what we do. So first thing, we all know to wash your hands, okay? <laughs> I remember when I started in nursing that we did not have gloves and I worked in trauma. Uh, we uh, gloves were not a thing we used. As you remember, we never started IVs with gloves because they were problematic. And we had finger cots. So whenever we had to do things that had blood and stuff and other body parts and other things on it, we actually just put a finger cot on. And we didn't wash our hands. And now we wash our hands. So there we go. Always introduce yourself to your patient. That builds a little bit of rapport and allows you to develop eye contact and observe how they're, as soon as you sit down and introduce yourself to you, how do they attend to you? How are they looking at you? Is a patient awake and alert and attending? I had a patient who could not stay awake in clinic last week. She was on a number of medications for a pain problem. And no matter how much I tried to stimulate her, she just kept falling asleep. Though I was with a surgeon who also fell asleep uh, while he was talking to a patient. He was post-call. And he suddenly woke up and said, hockey. And the patient said, no idea what the patient physician was talking about. Pay attention uh, to the mood and behavior of the patient and the family. Can they complete the tasks that you're asking them to do? Are they following your instruction completely? And know how the patient is dressed and have a sense of their height and weight. Dress is actually a very good attention to detail, especially when you're seeing someone for the first time. What do we want to collect? We want to collect objective and subjective information. And when they attend to your questions, how is their train of thought? Is it organized? Is it thoughtful? Is it realistic? How is their emotion displayed when providing a health history? And are they answering questions in a timely and appropriate manner? So we're really testing the processing, the anterior frontal cortex, of how they're processing this information and some of the association areas with such that the surgeon just spoke about. Because what we're testing really is we're testing this part here, which is your frontal part of the anterior frontal cortex. So we're checking planning and emotionally, how is the patient emotionally, as we've all seen patients with um, a frontal lobe injury, attending to task and judgment and expression of speech, which we just looked at, and speech and memory, and the connections of the association area. So what we're doing when we're initially investigating or talking to a patient, obtaining a history, we're actually looking at their high cortical function and not, test, not testing so much the association areas because it all gets there. So I have a, this is a classic, this is a patient we saw a little while ago who was sent to me. Um, she's a 45-year-old, she was a full-time nurse and she worked in a nursing home. Uh, and she attended clinic with her husband. She describes a, a six-month history of lack of sense of smell. And she wasn't the one who actually determined that. It was her colleague. She always got the patients with the wounds and all sorts of things. And Carol was totally of oblivious to this. And they loved the fact of that. And she actually didn't realize that she couldn't smell anything. And uh, personality changes. Her colleagues found her a little animated and somewhat a little bit inappropriate. 
Um, and this was, this was uh, correlated by her family. And this is what her husband had spoken to me. And during her clinic visit, she was very animated. She was overly animated and she had short disorganized responses. And her husband described changes in judgment and uh, short-term memory problems. And so just listening to that history, it kind of already tells you as the audience, so this is where I think the problem should be. But we didn't really expect to find what we did, and we sent Carol for her MRI, and there's Carol's tumor. Okay, so this is, uh, this is, uh, this is Carol's rounded meningioma, and that's eroding out through her nose, and this is a cystic component. But what's really interesting is that, and cranial nerve one is under, is, is under here, which was completely squished, hence her lack of sense of smell. But this was a benign, these are benign tumors of the meninges, but what was really interesting is that on other images, which I didn't show, it, it, it actually goes as far back as it, it takes up about two thirds of her frontal cortex. And, um, after, and so we took Carol to, to the OR pretty quickly, and, um, and, and, and it's squishing Carol's pituitary gland, which was very interesting. So Carol was actually beginning to show in her hormonal profiles some changes to her pituitary gland. Um, and Carol, we, we took Carol to the OR. The physician actually did a transphenoidal, uh, realized he probably couldn't get all of it. So Carol actually ended up having quite an extensive facelift post-surgery. It was lovely. Carol looked lovely. And her tumor was gone. Her smell did not return but Carol went back to work about four months after her surgery. So what was really interesting though is that listening to Carol's story and observing Carol, it was very clear that what we were looking at was a frontal lobe problem simply because um, her personality changes in judgment, changes in memory. And I knew it was pre-motor cortex because Carol walked into clinic. Okay. So I'm gonna move on a little bit and now talk about the bane of most nurses' existences, which are the cranial nerves. Most nurses, at least where I work, all remember we were, t I was taught this OOO to touch and feel. Um, some people heard on old Olympus towering top, all these things. But what's really interesting as I graduated many years ago is most nurses still remember this, but they don't remember the actual nerves that are associated with it. <laughs> so, so I say, and I say, so what does the O mean? They said, well, I don't know what the O means. And I said, well, we're gonna go through the cranial nerves and they all run for the elevator. Because no one likes to do these. These are not a lot of fun, but you know, they're actually very simple. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through why these are so simple and how to actually simplify them. So we do know that they're mostly located in the brainstem. So one and two are not there. Uh, one does not enter the brainstem and neither does cranial nerve two. And they are sequentially numbered. So I'm not gonna tell you anything you don't know. They, they run three through 12. They're either motor, sensory, or both, or mixed nerves. And if I say to them, there's so cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve, what do you think that nerve's about? And they say, I don't know, it's just, it's in the brain. Um, but I actually can teach cranial nerve assessments in 90 seconds or less. And so you can actually do a, actually a very fulsome, except the Snellen chart, you can actually do a fulsome cranial nerve exam in about a minute and a half. And, but what we're testing is we're really, we're testing the happiness of the brainstem. And this is the pons, it looks like a big olive, and this is the medulla or the medulla, and there's the midbrain. And we're testing the, this little section, which is actually about the size of the human adult thumb. So it's not a particularly big spot. And that's why when nerves get annoyed or, or, or squished or something, they often come in groups. And the ones things we re need to remember are three, five, and, tw and 10. And the reason we need to remember those is because they're reflexive. So when a patient's in coma, you actually don't say, Mr. Smith, can you hear this? Because he's in coma. But what you're doing, that nerve is located in the pons. So we're testing five, which happens to be in the pons, which is your corneal reflex. So what we're doing is we're actually testing the three areas of the brainstem when we're testing three, five, and 10, because they are simply reflexive and don't need conscious awareness. Okay. So this is how we're gonna talk about them. So we do know that this is my happy, obviously my, my nice downloaded smiley face. And we do know that this is the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And what we noticed, or I noticed, is that the upper numbered cranial nerves, three and four, were located in the upper part of the brainstem and actually managed the upper part of the face. Okay? The middle numbered cranial nerves, five through eight, are found in the middle part of the brainstem called the pons, and they happen to manage the majority of the middle part of the face. Okay, and the lower cranial nerves, 9 through 12, are, low, are found in the lower part of the uh, brainstem, the medulla, and they happen to manage the lower part of the face. 
So when patients show up and they have a pontine hemorrhage, I would assume, knowing where the, that the pons is the pontine area, that the problem would most likely be related between cranial nerves 5 and 8, and therefore I concentrate on those. So when we're looking at testing them, in breaking them down to stay the uppers, upper, 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 middle, 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 lower, 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 it kind of simplifies it instead of remembering, oh, the, the, the abdicin nerve is the O, 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 two, touch and feel. You know, when you're walking through that little acronym we all learned, um, really understanding them anatomically, and that actually helps us understand where these things go and what they do. So one thing we do know about the nerves, those they have to talk to each other. When you tell somebody a joke, you can't have half the face go up and the other half go down. So seven, so cranial nerve seven, which is your facial nerve, has to talk to the other nerve. So we do know, for example, that, that these two are not located in the brain stem, but three and four, which are in the midbrain, do eye movement, okay, five through eight, do the major part of the face, so the trigeminal nerve, the abdicin, which turns the eyes around. Uh, the facial and the trigeminal, most people have challenges with that in terms of, yeah, that's the trigeminal, that's the facial. And then the lower part of the brainstem or the medulla actually manages the lower part of the face and all the things that are part of lower part of the face. Okay. Upper, 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 middle, 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 lower, lower, lower. It's actually quite simple. And instead of complicating it for ourselves and saying, oh yeah, what's that one? Um, just remember that these are located sequentially and they are anatomically precise in where they go and what they do. So what I've done is we've taken, I've, I'm gonna walk you through. So cranial nerve one, it's sense of smell. Don't forget to pass, test both sides. So you ask the patient to close their eyes. You wave something under their nose that's familiar. Most often it's coffee and oranges, but don't use, um, don't use pepper. Pepper is an irritant, as is alcohol, okay? They not only sneeze on you, but actually alcohol tests cranial nerve five. It doesn't actually test one. So don't do anything that's, a, that, that's irritating. So we try to, and always use fam familiar scents. Don't rub pumpkin under some man's nose. He's gonna have no idea what that is. So we always use scents that are familiar and ask the patient to identify recognizing the reason we use two cents is because your brain will encode what you've already smelled. So if I put coffee on one side, my brain will say, she's waving something else under my nose, I'm going to assume it's coffee. So your brain's encoding information and bringing up, bringing up memory and olfactory memory. So you always have to test both nerves and we test them simultaneously. One thing we know about cranial nerve one is once it's gone, once you lose it, it often does not return. It's one, of the, it's one of the only peripheral nerves that actually does not recover, okay? Concussion, you can see it in concussion. Sometimes there's one nerve that's spared more than the other, and some patients will have partial sense of smell. So two is the optic. It does visual fields, the discs, and the Snell and chart. Um, really ask, so what you do is ask the you can do one or two things. You can ask the patient to cover their eye with one hand and say, tell me how many fingers and what you're looking at the visual field. And some people just ask them to look straight ahead. It gets kind of weird because people are staring at your face for 10 minutes and you're getting kind of into the patient's face. So I always, exp I always explain to patients, you know, you and I are going to get a bit uncomfortable for a little minute because I'm going to be staring at you and you're going to be staring at me. Um, and, and cover the uh, one eye with the hand and ask the patient to identify the number of fingers in the visual field. So how many fing if you say fingers, okay, then you're already giving it away. Sometimes we just say to the patient, uh, uh, can you see, oftentimes we just move the finger and that seems to make it a bit easier for the patient. And, you, and don't ever put your hands behind the shoulder. Like a lot of people do, oh, can you see that? Well, no, I actually can't see that. So you have to, or tell me when you can see this, because what happens is if we move it into the patient's visual field and we're testing visual fields. The most common disease that is lost in visual fields when we're testing, does anybody know in the audience? Glaucoma. Glaucoma, we lose visual fields. So that's one thing, when patients begin to lose visual fields, I, I need to think about whether we've got a patient with early glaucoma. And you again repeat it on the other side. The Snellen chart, um, it's, uh, we, you get the patient to stand about 20 feet or I guess about 20 feet away if you have the card. It's a length of the hand, which is about 14 inches or so, and ask the patient to read as best that they can. The ocular motor response, it tests the health of the midbrain. So we all know when we're testing cranial nerve three, we're looking at is anything going on upstairs that we need to be concerned about. 
Okay, uh, move the light quickly onto the pupil. Don't get one of those big giant honking flashlights. We have at our hospital, we have those big ones, you know, in case the power goes out. And by the time you're there, the pupil's already constricted. So you have to go in very quickly and very, and there. And a lot of nurses are actually using their phones, the light on their phone to actually test it, but we're concerned about the LED light actually in the optic disc. <laughs> Okay? And we repeat it on the other side. And the pupil on the other side should constrict at the same time. It's called the consensual reflex. Oftentimes we put a hand here, we wave it in and wave it out very quickly. And sometimes we come in under like, the, uh, like a small U and into the pupil. And we're actually looking for pupil, pupillary constriction. Okay. Three, four, and six are tested together. We're looking at uh, the movement of the eye. So cranial nerve three, for example, does four out of the six muscles to the eye. Uh, so we're asking the patient to look up. We're asking the patient to look down, we're at side to side, and down and in. Now, I was taught it's like the cardinal signs of, you know, this way, this way, this way, and this way. And what we do know is cranial nerve six, and some people have seen patients with cranial nerve six palsy, uh, the eye moves to the shoulder, so when you say the patient will move this way, the eye looks straight, and this eye goes that way. And that creates a double vision for the patient, as you know, so I always ask the patient, I move around their visual field and say, tell me where the double vision occurs, and I can actually tell which cranial nerve palsy I have based on uh, where their double vision occurs. So what we do is, if you move up, it's three, move down, it's three, if you move your eye towards your nose, it's cranial nerve three. If you move it towards your shoulder, it's cranial nerve six. And down and in is cranial nerve four. Some people do this and this and this, and then ask the patient to do this. And I often, often what I do is I say, follow my finger and I touch the tip of the nose and the patient's eyes automatically go down and in and that actually tests four. So when we're doing this, we can, we can do up, down, side to side, and we're looking for observing eye movement and the patient's complaint of double vision when they're actually being assessed for their visual fields. Trigeminal, uh, we've all heard of trigeminal neuralgia, which is a very painful syndrome. Uh, it, the trigeminal nerve, meaning tri, it has three branches, V1, V2, and V3. Um, and what we do is we, I put my fingers like this on the face, so the upper part of the forehead is one, this is V2 around the cheek, and V3. This, the trigeminal nerve also supplies the teeth and gums and bits of the tongue. So often patients with trigeminal neuralgia will have dental work done, teeth out, all sorts of root canals before someone diagnoses them with trigeminal neuralgia. So what you do is you touch the upper, the middle, and the lower, and you test them bilaterally. And I was told sensation is kind of like you're pregnant. You're either it's there or it's not. So if, pay, if, you go to, if you go like this, you say, can you feel that? Say, oh, I don't know, can you do that again? We often know that that's actually legit, that it, they can actually feel it. But if they do that and say, well, one side, side feels a bit like dental numbness, then we know that in fact the patient has a problem. We, it also does a coil reflex, and don't try to avoid this. Some patients that are conscious, they don't really like you doing that, sticking stuff in their eyes. And because nurses historically, because we don't want to do it, we actually never touch the cornea. We often touch the sclera, so we completely bypass the corneal reflex. So make sure if you are testing the corneal reflex that you're actually touching the cornea. And we're also looking for motor, which is mastication. So you, you, you put your hands by the side of the ear, you run your hand down and ask them to bite down. And you, could feel, you can feel that giant chewing muscle. So obviously if it's a sensory and a motor, this would be a mixed nerve. And we know that cranial nerve five tests the health of the pons. So now we're in the middle part of the brainstem, it's a middle number cranial nerve. And that's why this, the only one that's reflexive of this is the corneal reflex. And that's why if you work in ICU, when we're testing these, we're testing three, five, and 10. Facial, we're looking for symmetry. Uh, ask the patient to lip, lift up their eyebrows, puff out their cheeks, show me your teeth, Check to ensure that both sides of the cheeks are strong. And sometimes what we can see with patients with subtle, uh, subtle um, facial weakness is this fold right here disappears. So they have a, with me, it's very clear, you have this wrinkle, it's a giant wrinkle, and the other side, the giant wrinkle's kind of gone. Um, and that's how you can see a subtle facial weakness. The other thing is we ask the patient to close their eyes and you try and open their eyes. And if you've ever managed a patient with an acoustic neuroma, sometimes they have a partial facial weakness post-surgery and they have difficulty closing their eyes. Because seven looks like a hook, like the number seven, and it pulls everything down. Okay, so if you think of that cranial nerve, the facial nerve, 
um, cranial nerve seven looking like a hook, a number seven, it pulls everything down. So everything gets weak on the side of the face. Different from five, which is the pain, which is the uh, mostly a pain sensory nerve, very strong sensory component. Vestibular cochlea, this is the eighth nerve, which is responsible for balance. And sometimes patients, uh, it's a challenge to determine if your patient has a, has a cerebellar problem or whether a patient has an inner ear problem. Um, and so what we do is we get that tuning fork, you bang the tuning fork on your hand, make sure you hold it at the right end. Some people hold it and they actually turn the tuning fork off. And you ask the patient, can you hear this? And then you say, can you tell me when it stops? What you want to look at is you're looking at air conduction and ask them if they can hear the pitch. If you, if you don't have a tuning fork, most people don't walk around with a tuning fork, you can do the whisper test. We call it the Rice Krispie test where we do this. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Okay. Ask the patient to tell you when the pitch stops and bang it again and put it on the forehead. Uh, don't leave it there for long periods of time. Don't kind of stick it there and say, oh, you know, how you doing, Charlie? What's going on? Because patients get nauseated. If you've ever had it done or you've ever practiced on yourself, it actually makes you feel kind of weird after a couple of minutes. So uh, try not to leave it on the forehead for, for a long period of time. So can you hear that and then touch it? And it should lateralize to both sides equally. Okay. 9, uh, 10, and 12 are tested. Now we're in the lower part of the brainstem. 9, 10, and 12 are tested simultaneously. The tongue is the easiest one. Can you stick out your tongue? As soon as the patient sticks out their tongue, you know that they're done. And the tongue always points to the side of the lesion, which is kind of fun. It makes it a little easier. Um, make sure that it sticks out straight. And then what we do is you always ask the patient, before I do this, I say, do you uh, gag when you brush your teeth? And if they say yes, I kind of do this at the side. Because you're getting in there and you're looking in there. And, the, and what we need to do is you need to put the tongue depressor. The tongue is an extremely strong muscle. You have to push the tongue down. So it means you have to get back in there, like you got your shoe in there, and push the tongue down. And by pushing down the tongue, uh, tongue down, can you only see the uvula lift up? When you say, ah, you ask the patient to say, ah, that uvula, that little dangly doodle should lift up. And the palate does open. Okay, so that's what we're looking for, the palate. And you could see a gag at the back. So nine actually is the sensory to gag and 10 is the gag. And that's sometimes we're testing the strength, health of the medulla or medulla. And sometimes when you have a patient in ICU, right? And the, the people are tugging on that too. It just makes me kind of do this. Um, it's because they're really testing what is the patient's gag reflex like? Is it quite depressed? Is it normal? And sometimes when we suction patients and they decerebrate, it's because we're actually irritating the gag and that's where some of the motor tracts are in that part of the brainstem and that's why patients do that. Okay? Accessory, you can ask the patient to shrug their shoulders or turn your hand, and you ask them to push against the hand on the other side, and that's really all we talk about when we do cranial nerves. And again, you can do them quite quickly. So in summary of those, the upper nerves go to the upper part of the face, and they're located in the upper part of the brainstem. Middle, 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 and then lower, lower, lower. We're going to now talk about the uh, motor, sensory, and cerebellar exam and why we need to do these. And sometimes uh, if you're in a, in a clinic setting and the patient comes in with a certain, pro, uh, certain when you read the referral and you're assessing the patient, I actually don't do anything for my patients. Well, I shouldn't say that. I actually watch them get on and off clinic tables because I want to see what they're doing unconsciously. Because sometimes the unconsciousness of, of an act often will tell me whether or not I'm looking at a non-surgical or surgical patient. Because sometimes if they come in and say, you know, my leg's really weak, and they can easily get on and off a clinic table, I need to think about, is there something else going on with the patient? So when, I'm, when we're doing motor sensory and cerebellar, we're really testing also not just the, the, the primary motor cortex, but also some of the association areas. So the motor exam is utilized as an indicator for evaluation of muscle size, tone and tenderness, and the strength of normal and abnormal movements. And here's the, motor, here's, a, here's the motor cortex, and what we're testing is, is it coming down from the gray matter, which is actually quite small, into the association areas, into the thalamus, where the thalamus decides how it goes, and then as it travels down into the medulla, or the pontine medullary junction, where it crosses over into the pyramidal system and goes down the other side. So when we're testing, when we're testing the motor system, we're not just testing way up here in the motor cortex, 
We're actually testing thalamic transfer and we're also testing the brainstem. So when you have a patient who's got a motor weakness and they have a facial palsy, I have to think, where do those things come together? Well, they kind of come together in the brainstem. So it allows you to think about where things are happening and is the best indicator for recovery. It should, you should examine proximal to distal um, and with the muscle groups in the upper and lower extremities, the patient should push against force and you have to observe for bulk and tone and any unintended movements, a tremor, um, and are the movements smooth? And that kind of I, tells me how the basal ganglia is doing and the premotor cortex is doing. And we grade motor from zero to five, zero being paralysis and five being normal strength. And the caveat to that when you're assessing the patient is you always have to be, you always have to be aware of the patient's age and, the, and their muscle bulk normally. For example, if you're examining someone, a big, strong guy, you actually will, you, you, the testing of that actually is much more difficult because you have to really try and break that arm or break that knee when you're testing for motor strength. And I'll show you what I mean by that. But then you have the little tea and toasters, you know, the little elderly ladies uh, who weigh about 95 pounds and you're out there and you're, you know, so you have to be a little conscious of, of motor strength and of the, of the normal age of the patient. So the strength should be equal on both sides. Um, and this is what I mean by if uh, my colleague Angela, who was testing me, her and I are probably, I'm probably slightly stronger than Angela, so she had a little bit more difficulty actually breaking my shoulders, which are C5, C6, because she's not as strong as I am. So if I have a big gentleman, I actually stand on one of those bedside stools that help patients get on, on clinic tables because I actually want to stand and push a little bit more, have a little bit more force towards a patient. So what you do is when you're looking at these, the purpose of doing this, testing them bilaterally, is to ensure that what we're looking at, and don't forget that these myotomes are very specific to where they're isolated within the spinal cord or where they come out of the spinal cord. And so what we're looking for is, is this side equal to the other side? And does that correlate with what the patient is telling me? And by understanding that the patient has a motor weakness, then we have to figure out, well, where in the central nervous system can motor weakness be found that can cause a pathology? So we know that you can have a spinal cord, uh, you can have a disc herniation that can cause motor weakness. We know that it can be traveling of paths that go from the spinal cord to the thalamus, so there's a problem with the brainstem. We know that there could be a problem in the thalamus and transmission of that motor. And we know that there could be a problem in the prefrontal or frontal cortex. So when you're looking at a patient with, an ice, with, a, with a hemiparesis, it can actually occur in four or five parts of the central nervous system. You can have a pathology. And that's why understanding what other parts of the central nervous system can, can what other functions they do, can actually help you isolate where the problem is located. Okay, so we're testing various myotomes along the, where they come out through the central, the upper parts of the spinal cord, and we go right down here to testing the strength of the hands, and again, testing them bilaterally to ensure that there's equal strength. The lower extremities, they really start at L1 to L2 and go down to L5, and there's some that are very specific. Actually, I want to go back for one second. Um, this one in particular... Uh, this one here. Uh, one of the ways I was told by one of my neurosurgeons to remember where these go, if you do the, it looks like this, it looks like a number six. This is a C6 area, the cervical six area. So the supply of C, of C6 or, or the cervical six goes into these two fingers and the first side of this finger. This is C7, that's the one I remember. <laughs> My background's not neurology, it's trauma, so when I learned how to assess patients, I could never remember. You know, there's some things you just can't get your head around. And I couldn't remember. He goes, I don't understand. We've been doing this for two months, and you're still not getting it. Yeah, I know, but I remember this is C7. <laughs> okay, so one thing, you know, these kind of things just stick in your mind. So if you think about this as C6, the, the, the sensation of myotome, or dermatomes and myotomes go to C6. And that's one way to remember. So the one behind it has to be C7. Okay. The legs are the same way, completing the motor exam. You watch for smoothness of, 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 of physical movements, bulk and tone, for example. Patients that have very bad sciatica can have gastrocnemius uh, atrophy, which means the calf muscle is smaller on one side than the other. And there can be differences in tone of the patient, depending upon if we're looking at upper motor or lower motor or an injury. And you ability of the patient to follow command. And that's why when you're saying to the patient, can you take off your shoes and uh, get on the table for me and undo your top button, you're actually testing 
the frontal cortex of the patient's ability to judgment, follow command. You're actually testing the smoothness of the cerebellum, the testing of the motor cortex, the sensory, yes, my taking my shoes off, my feet are on the floor. So asking the patient to do three things in a neural, in, in a clinic or even in a hospital room actually can test the system in a gross way, actually all together at the same time. Okay? So in this we're testing, it goes all the way from L1 all the way down to L5, and L5, sorry, my feet are dirty in that, it's, I think I was on the floor for a long time. The great toe is L5, and that's the sciatic nerve. So patients, I ask them to step up on their tippy toes, and that actually tests their ability to maintain their balance, and that's the sciatic nerve. So if a patient has great toe weakness, that's very specific, almost like C6, it's very specific to the L5 uh, myotome. We've all seen pronator drift. Um, various people ask the patient to do various things. We ask the patient's eyes to do this and say, put two, pretend you have two bowls of soup and hold them for 15 seconds and I watch for this. And some people say, well, what does that actually test? Because a patient does this or does this or turns the bowl of soup over, it can, it can test two areas actually. It can test the motor strip, and the ability of the patient to hold the arm, they've got motor weakness, or it can actually test the parietal lobe for sensory, that the patient actually doesn't know where their hand is in space. So it can test both areas. And if I have a patient with a pronator drift, I actually test, then I test the motor strip. Do I have, does it correlate with a motor problem or does this correlate more with a sensory problem? So it really depends. Sometimes we do, this is a very common test in patients with subdurals where we want to look at if the subdural is growing, say, can you do this? And they do that. So it really depends upon what you're correlating this with. But oftentimes most people associate the pronator diff with the motor cortex. Sensory testing, we're really testing various tracts. Corticospinal tract is the motor tract, and in this one we're actually testing two tracts. We're testing the spinal thalamic and the dorsal column. And uh, the one, the way to remember is that spinal thalamic has a P and a T in it, so it t carries pain, temperature, and crude touch. So PTT, okay, so a spinal thalamic, a P and a T, so pain, temperature, and crude touch. Okay, and, and spinal thalamic crosses over right away, and the dorsal column is everything else, vibration and position, sense and fine touch, and it crosses over in the brainstem. Patients that we know have, um, can have diabetic neuropathy or nephropathy often lose uh, vibration, for example. Uh, B12 deficiency loses vibration. And what we do is we wanna test furthest away from this area um, when we do vibration, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So these are the two tracks, the spinal thalamic and the dorsal column. The dorsal column crosses over and the spinal thalamic. And there's various other tracks. There's the tectospinal, there's the, re the rubrospinal. There's all sorts of tracks within the central nervous system that carry information. But the two sensory tracks most commonly are the spinal thalamic and the dorsal column, which is the one we, 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 t we test. If we look here, uh, this is a great picture in terms of telling you where the problem could be isolated with the patient. There's many, many, many various types of these pictures out there. And, what, and again, we're looking at, if we look at C6, for example, we know that that comes along and feeds the major thumb. And L5, which goes right down here to the great, actually the great toe. This one says L4, but it's L5. Okay, and these are what we're testing when we're testing both sensory and motor. And that's why when patients, and patients are very distinctive when they have a lower, let's say a disc herniation, they're saying it causes around my bum, it goes down the back of my leg, then it crosses over around my knee, and they can almost draw a pattern of where the pain is. It's because what they're doing is they're tracing, they're actually tracing the pathway of the, of the nerve root. And some of these nerve roots are actually over a meter long, depending upon how tall you are. So some of these are very long and some of them are very short. So sensory, we break off a Q-tip and ask the patient to close their eyes because you don't want the patient encoding what they expect to find. So if someone rubs a Q-tip on your hand, you've already rubbed a Q-tip in your hand previously, so you kind of know what a Q-tip feels like. So you ask the patient to close their eyes and you start at the foot and you ask them to identify things that are sharp or dull. And again, we're testing both the spinal thalamic and the dorsal column simultaneously. And you do side to side. And again, if the patient says, can you do that again? 
Um, the difficulty with that is, is that sometimes we introduce bias into when we're testing patients for sensory. We don't want to push too hard. We test one side a little for, uh, heavier than the other. So oftentimes I'll do it again, but often if the patient says, has no idea that that's what you're testing, then that sensation is lost. But if the patient says, well, I can feel it, but can you do it again? Oftentimes it is there. It's often the interjection of personal bias when you're testing patients. So identify sharp and dull, start at distal, and then move proximal. Uh, move from limb to limb in the same distribution. Ensure that you're testing the same dermatomes. So for example, if you're testing L5 on one side, don't inadvertently test for L4 on the other. Okay. Sharp is spinal thalamic and fine touch is dorsal column. Or crude touch. Crude touch is spinal thalamic and fine touch is dorsal column. Okay. Vibrating tuning fork. Uh, what we do, again, you bang it on your hand and you put it on a bony process. Um, and again, like you do with the ear, you grab the end and say to the patient, can you tell me when it stops? And what you're testing is you're testing the dorsal column. Um, and if the patient doesn't feel it, oftentimes our, di our bad diabetic patients don't feel the vibration or if they have a B12 deficiency, and then you move it to the ankle and you repeat the process, then you move it to the knee. Once you get to the knee though, if the patient uh, cannot feel vibration at the knee, if depending upon if it's equal or bilateral, if it's bilateral, you're looking at a, a systemic problem. If it is isolated to one leg over the other, you're more like looking at a lateral spinal cord issue, such as a, uh, um, or a posterior spinal cord problem. Um, and so patients with uh, B12 deficiency oftentimes only feel vibration when it's bad and undiagnosed at the level of the knee. Okay, so, and when we're looking at proprioception, do you know where your body is in space? For example, my brain knows that my feet are on the floor and you all know that you're sitting with your legs crossed. Um, is that you placed, and oftentimes we do this like this and we, we actually squish the hand. You place your fingers on either side of the large joint, ask the patient to close their eyes, and you say, um, can you tell me if, you're, if your toe is up or down? And that really tells us whether or not does the patient have a sense of proprioception. And that's very important in patients with parietal lobe stroke or per MCA stroke, uh, because if they don't know where their body is in space, we can see it as severe in patients with neglect who actually don't even recognize that they have a left or right side. We had a patient the other day who said, oh, someone's got the same shirt on as I do. And they actually didn't recognize that it was their arm. And those patients, when they're in the wheelchair and pushing down, they have no idea their arm's caught in the wheelchair. So neglect can be quite severe. And, and what we want to determine is, does this patient have a sense of where their body is in space? Okay. Cerebellum, it's one of the only parts outside of the brainstem, which is really ipsilateral function and some tracks within this system. And the purpose of it is really integration of both sen of sensory information um, to facilitate smooth and coordinated body movements. So things like riding a bike or playing the piano. They also believe it's important for coordination, timing, and balance. Um, and um, it also, they believe it, it, it plays a role in working memory and verbal memory. And one of the best things I do in cerebellum is I put a pen on the floor and ask the patient to bend down and pick it up. By doing that, I'm actually testing both sides of the cerebellum simultaneously. And I'm actually testing cranial nerve three, I mean eight, because I'm seeing whether or not the patient's vestibular system can actually correlate. And we do know as we age, our cerebellum and vestibular system, which are kissing cousins, um, can't tolerate those roller coaster rides that you used to love when you were a kid, right? As you notice as you age, when your kids want to go, yeah, yeah, no, you go, you have a good time, it's because your body, your cerebellum and your uh, eighth nerve can't really coordinate themselves without you feeling like you're on a fun house or you're, gonna, you're nauseated. So we do know that the cerebellum is responsible for coordination of uh, body movement and balance. Rapid alternating movement. You add, there's a couple of ways we do it. We do the flip your hand over and recognize that the patient may be left or right handed. So one might be faster than the other. Doesn't necessarily mean that it is pathological. Um, and or do the do this and ask them to change fingers. We do gait. We have the patient walk heel to toe, recognizing of course that that could be affected by age. As we age, we lose the we have less ability to walk heel to toe, mainly because our eighth nerve, our, our vestibular nerve, all the fluid around the eighth nerve dries, dries out a wee bit. 
Okay. And we do the sh uh, shin to heel test. We have the patient run their heel up and down the side of the shin, and that tells us whether or not the patient has coordination. Because one thing about the cere cerebellum is that there's various sections of the cerebellum that, that manage different things. So for example, the middle parts of the cerebellum actually manage trunk support. So that these are the patients that tip over all the time, and, so do, and the vermix, the connections of the of the cerebellum. So when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at heel to shin, we're actually testing the lower parts of the cerebellum, and this is the upper parts of the cerebellum. So we're testing the sections of the cerebellum separately. We ask the patient. We all know this as the Romberg. So we ask the patient to put their feet together and close their eyes and put their hands straight out in front of them, and we watch for patients swaying. Sometimes we do this, or bowls of soup, and, and sometimes what we actually do, this is it here, and that, and sometimes we actually push on the patient's chest to see how much the patient sways, and if they have to step back and lose their balance. Then we do the finger to nose edge we just talked about, and we, and we test sides simultaneously. Okay. So when we're talking about a neurological exam, what we're actually doing is we're actually doing this almost like this big question mark, that we're testing this big question mark. So we're testing this area here and what the patient is saying to us and what we're observing and the, with the conversations and how the patient's attending to task. We're testing the, 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 mo the premotor and the motor. One thing is, as, uh, when looking at this, this is a sagittal MRI, the motor strip is actually really far back. The central sulcus is actually way back here. And then we're testing the parietal lobe with proprioception and sensory with sharp and dull, this, the occipital lobe with vision and the cerebellum. And it can, one of the things we're testing constantly as we're doing this is how well is all, is all is this information integrated within the system. And if we're seeing something we shouldn't be seeing, we should be testing, so what else does this do? And what else do, do these areas do so I can try and correlate what I'm finding? Because sometimes it tells us whether or not we're moving into a danger zones with patients as, there are, as they change neurologically. Okay? And that's the end of the talk. Yeah.